Hey guys, what's up and welcome back to my channel. This is the first episode of Veil Lifted, a video essay where I discuss fascinating cases that involve secrecy and discovery. I will not be making these videos every week, just every so often. I'm sorry if there's glare from my glasses. <laughs> Ready to glare. I have migraines, so I need to keep them on. This is the story of a woman whose unwavering conviction and delusion helped her rise to the top. The lies can only hold on for so long, especially when your $4.5 billion worth can turn to zero in the matter of months. This is the story of Elizabeth Holmes. Holmes is a 35 year old health technology entrepreneur. She was born in Washington, D.C. Holmes attended Stanford studying chemical engineering. She also worked as a student researcher and lab assistant. In 2004, Holmes dropped out and chose to use her tuition money for her future healthcare technology company. This was a bold move for someone who had not finished their studies in a field that requires it. Contrary to art, healthcare in the medical field demands certification. Nonetheless, Holmes continued in her mission to create her company. A few striking things about Elizabeth involve her appearance and her voice. Usually appearance would not be brought up, but here I believe it's a pertinent part of the puzzle. In videos, one can note that Holmes rarely blinks. People don't even know that they have a basic human right to be able to get access to information about themselves and their own bodies. Which gives her gaze an intense and potentially disturbing quality. Her blue eyes are often bloodshot in videos as well. Additionally, as a big fan of Steve Jobs, her wardrobe resembled his. In the documentary The Inventor Out for Blood in Silicon Valley, she states that her closet contains the same pieces of clothing in mass in order to avoid wasting time picking an outfit. She wore a black turtleneck, black slacks, and a blazer at times. Another interesting element is her deep voice that to many appears unnatural. Ex-coworkers of hers claim her voice is actually a few octaves higher and that she purposely adjusted it. Her family maintains that it's real. While this isn't of paramount importance, it just adds to the questions. When describing herself in the footage shown in the documentary, Holmes seems to be a business version of I'm not like the other girls, explaining how her friends were books, and that she was always working rather than having a healthy social life. She also had a Yoda quote painted on the wall of her company to remind you, she's not like the other girls. The question was, what was the process of dropping out of Stanford when I was 19 like? and. Uh, and what kind of advice did I get? Um, interestingly, it was a fairly binary decision. Um, I got to a point where I, I actually originally did not intend to drop out of Stanford, but I wasn't going to any classes and I was spending all of my time talking to VCs. And so then <laughs> logistically, it just seemed like a waste of money because I was you know, taking 20 units and I wasn't showing up. So, um, so, so originally the concept was, well, I uh, take a, a leave of absence and then I, it became really clear that you know I, I was at a point where another few classes in chemical engineering was not necessary for what I wanted to do. Holmes likened having blood drawn intravenously to a torture experiment. With this in mind, Theranos, her company, aimed to create a system where blood could be analyzed via only a few drops taken from the tip of a finger. She pitched this idea to her professor, Phyllis Gardner, who taught medicine at Stanford. Gardner told Holmes that she didn't think it would work and that her claim of reaping vast amounts of data from a few drops of blood was impossible. However, Holmes persisted and managed to get someone to back her idea. His name was Chaining Robertson. Dean at the School of Engineering. A recurring theme we see with Holmes is her ability to charm people, specifically older and powerful men, into not only investing in her company, but in her. The investors were so impressed with her that it appears that none of them really looked into her data. It seems no one looked closely enough to see that she was misrepresenting everything. At its peak, Theranos was worth $9 billion. Another factor in this story is that one of the leaders of Theranos, Sonny Balwani, actually was romantically involved with Holmes. They did not disclose this relationship to investors, but the employees seemed to know that something was going on. In the HBO documentary, many relay that she had a charm that made people give in to her ideas, even if they really were just ideas and realistically impossible. This charm is what allowed Theranos to stay afloat as long as it did. 
That along with incredibly strict and paranoid contracts that locked people into silence. Can you tell us a secret? I don't have many secrets, I'm... Holmes was paranoid. Most people in Silicon Valley want to keep their ideas secret, but Holmes won up to them. The contracts employees signed included not being allowed to speak ill of the company at any point and not being allowed to discuss Theranos generally. Holmes also was there at interviews even when it was for a position such as a receptionist that usually doesn't warrant the founder's presence. Though her presence could have been a positive about how involved she was, it only showed how actually controlling she was. A former receptionist said her screen was being monitored so higher-ups could see every single tab she opened. Other employees discussed how they'd email someone without copying Balwani or Holmes, and somehow Balwani responded. In fact, even when she hired interns or engineers, she wasn't open or clear about what their mission was. Engineers claimed that this was an abnormal for Silicon Valley and startups generally, but later they realized why she was vague. All of those who came forward with information after leaving Theranos were threatened with lawsuits. Holmes had astutely hired lawyers from the get-go in order to silence anyone who might offer critique. Eventually, they had bodyguards escorting people in and out along with key cards that tracked who entered and exited the room. This is understandable, but along with the rest, it just shows a suffocating environment. Theranos' mission appealed to many because Holmes marketed it as a way to democratize healthcare. She likened getting typical blood tests once a year to a picture versus using Theranos as a video. Why? Because the central selling point for Theranos was a machine called the Edison. This was inspired by Thomas Edison and his quote, I have not failed, I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Interestingly, Edison was also fraudulent in similar ways to Holmes, so her choice was perfect. This Edison machine was supposed to take the few drops of blood and analyze them. It was made small enough to fit on a countertop so people could easily have one at home. They said it could run 200 tests. The reality, coming from engineers who worked in the lab, was that not even half of those tests worked. In fact, Ian Gibbons, the former Theranos chief scientist, was driven into despair by the lies and misrepresentation Theranos continuously pushed. Sadly, this led to his suicide the same day he was let go. Theranos never contacted the family to express condolences. They did, however, ask for some confidential documents back. Walgreens is a pharmacy store chain. Theranos eventually made a deal with them. This deal got an additional $400 million of funding for Holmes' company. Walgreens ended up being a part of what finally exposed Theranos as misleading to say the least. Blood would be taken from patients at Walgreens and was then brought to Theranos where they tested blood with machines. Not their Edison machine, competitor machines. That shows you how little trust there was in the Edison. As time went on, patients would come to get their few drops taken and the phlebotomist would tell them that due to the test their doctor required, they'd need to have blood taken the traditional way. So they felt tricked, obviously. The reason they needed more blood was because, as her professor told Holmes, what she was trying to do was impossible. The Wall Street Journal was where Theranos began its public demise. A journalist by the name John Carreyrou wrote a piece that exposed Theranos and their misleading claims. I strongly suggest reading it, it'll be linked down below. One of the sources that tipped the Wall Street Journal was a man named Tyler Schultz. His grandfather was the former Secretary of State and was a huge, huge believer in Holmes. Tyler's family had known Holmes for a long time, and when Tyler Schultz heard of her project, he wanted to be a part of it so he was hired as an intern. He gave the Wall Street Journal information about the accuracy, or rather, inaccuracy of the tests. Needless to say, Theranos figured out it was him, and one day he went to his grandfather's house and had two lawyers there waiting for him. In the end, no legal battle occurred as Theranos had bigger fish to fry. Once the Wall Street Journal story hit, everyone began analyzing Holmes' actions, asked more questions, demanded to see proper results, and so on. As of now, both Holmes and Balwani are facing fraud charges that could land them in prison for 20 years. The case is currently in discovery, so the defense and prosecution are exchanging information. So now all we can do is wait. I think the first piece is realizing that it's not necessarily about age. And 
Um, people like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and the Google guys and Michael Dell and Larry Ellison and others have, have demonstrated that. Um, I think it's about, um, it's about technology, it's about people, it's about the, the conviction and dedication that, that an entrepreneur has in going into it to make something work no matter what. And um, uh, then it's about finding people who believe in you because the worst possible thing in the world is to have someone who doesn't believe in you backing you because it's not going to result in a good situation. So I thought this case was deeply fascinating because it astounds me that she got away with it for so long. I genuinely don't understand how that happened. She started her company at 19 and pretty much only 10 years later did people start really asking questions. So though I can't outline the entire story, I tried to include everything that I thought was relevant. This story seems so surreal. How do people invest large amounts of money without looking at the company's financial audit? How can they invest without looking critically at the results shown so far, if there are even any results to show? Did people just want a breakthrough? Is that why they were blinded? Was the fact that she was an attractive woman a significant part in the trust given to her? These are the questions I found myself asking. How does one woman, who clearly didn't have as much knowledge as she thought, fool the world like this. I also wondered why it is that people would trust someone without certification for something that's in the scientific slash medical field. I also wondered, considering she doesn't have certification, why did people believe that she had this advanced idea that could work? Because she didn't have a team of scientists until she had already formed the idea. So the implication is she formed the idea by herself and how would someone with limited knowledge form such an advanced idea? My bottom line here and what really aggravates me, apart from people lying about who they are and what they do, which <laughs> makes me want to bash my head in, this fraud is life endangering fraud. Plenty of people took tests via Theranos and easily may have received incorrect information about their health. So there was actually an interview where Holmes is told a man got results via Theranos that he believes were incorrect, and shortly after, he had a heart attack. So perhaps those are unrelated, but if you watch the HBO documentary that I brought up, many of the people who were working in the lab were saying that sometimes they would just fudge the results. Sometimes they'd have to pass the results through Edison and then a competing machine to see what was right and what was wrong. And the reality was that Edison barely ever came up with the true and accurate results that reflect reality. While I don't have much faith in any system, it's mind boggling to me that someone who claims that they really want to democratize health and healthcare don't do any research and then on the contrary, put people's life at risk. I believe the individual is the answer to the challenges of healthcare. But we can't engage the individual in changing outcomes unless individuals have access to the information they need to do so. The right to protect the health and well-being of every person, of those we love, is a basic human right. A right defined in the United Nations Universal Declaration on Human Rights. Yet in the United States today, health care is the leading cause of bankruptcy. And the lack of it, the leading cause of the suffering associated with finding out too late in the disease progression process that someone you love is really, really sick. How does that happen? How does someone get away with that for so long? Anyways guys, let me know what you think about this in the comments down below. Do you think she's deluded or do you think she's aware that she's lying? Because an argument that was made in the documentary is that she really believes the lies she brings up. 
So let me know what you think in the comments down below. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you to my patrons as always, and let's get right into the fan art.